Hey, Alec. Hey, Barb. So today, I'm excited about mark the marketing share today because today we're going to discuss something that can be great and something that can be not great if it's not working, right? And that is the dynamic between sales and marketing, right? Yeah. I'll tell you, uh, the relationship with sales is probably the most important one, and it's also the toughest. So uh, <laughs> this is going to be a good topic. And we've got a great guest on for this show today. Uh, Kyle Hamer is with us. Kyle, welcome to the show. Alec, Barb, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, start, just real start, start us off a little bit. Tell us about your background. Cause you've been, um, a CMO. So you've been in this leadership spot, worked with a lot of sales teams. So I know you've got a lot to bring to this, but maybe just real quick, uh, give us a little bit of your background. How'd you get into marketing? How'd you, you know, how'd you, how'd you get to, to where you are today? Sure. I can give you the, I can give the boring, the boring version, which sounds like a resume, or I can give you a little bit more exciting one. And I'll, I'll start off with a bit more exciting one. Cause I think it's relevant to today's topic. Yeah. Uh, when when people ask me how did you end up in marketing, I say that uh, you know I started off in marketing where it really really had an impact in the business, and that was inside of the sales organization. So I was out there actually closing deals, signing people up, bringing revenue in the door, and somewhere along the way I got a little irritated with the marketing department I was working with, and I thought, man, I can sure do this better than you can. <laughs> and before long. I had figured out that I was so much better at marketing than I was at sales that I found myself on the dark side over here trying to do one to many instead of one to one. But uh, the, the long story short is, is I spent my first eight years of my career, uh, direct sales, sales management, uh, transitioned into ownership, thought it was going to be a, uh, uh, thought my agency was actually going to be like a sales enablement, uh, kind of the, the, the stickiness between sales and marketing. It ended up being a full blown digital agency. And then from there, I found my way back into corporate America in uh, marketing leadership roles and have been driving high velocity software as a service business transactions for the last uh, about nine years. So that is really cool. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah. And obviously in this type of that type of environment, which, I'm, you know, Barb and I are also familiar with this, that, you know, working with sales, it's like that, that's a key part of, of what we've got to do. Right. So, you know, I guess. Talk to me a little bit about uh, what are the characteristics of a good or a high, like high functioning marketing and sales partnership? What does that look like when it's working well? Ooh, you know, I think one of the things that's that's important when you think about it working well, you, the things you'll see inside of the business is you'll see a lot of energy, you'll see a lot of growth, um, you'll see a high degree of focus on the customer and the outcomes. And, and typically, we see that, you know, depending on where the business is at in its evolution, we see that in improved profitability. It's not just a, hey, let's grow for growth's sake, but let's find a way to grow and grow profitably. And unfortunately, I think we've been a bit in the, uh, the washing machine or the giant paint tumbler, paint shaker uh, for the last 15 years with sales and marketing where they've taken oil, throwing it in with water and shaking it as fast and as hard as they possibly can and said, why can't you guys get along? And the reality is, is that based on how they've put us together, we weren't really intended to mix. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a part of separating those pieces and parts and figuring out what is it from marketing that marketing can really do to drive sales? And what is it from sales that they can provide to marketing to really help them expand their pipeline and move? Forward? Yeah, yeah. So what is that Let's dig into that a little bit more, right? So, what what is how how is it that marketing and sales should work together, and how where's that balance? Well, I think it starts at the top. I think that you know most businesses the the revenue goal is oftentimes almost singularly looked at as something delivered by sales. Sales needs back office operations. They need marketing. They probably need product at some level. They need additional support across the org, and yet they're the ones given full boat responsibility for the revenue number. And I think that if you want a an organization where sales and marketing is tightly aligned, mm -hmm. they need to be lockstep at what part of the revenue exchange or that baton handoff from uh, lead to prospect or prospect into opportunity. Uh, lockstep into what parts that they own. Oftentimes, marketing teams are only really instrumented or incentivized to drive leads or MQLs. So what can we get at the top? Can you give me more, 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 more? 
And sales team will watch those numbers grow and marketing team walking around with a great deal of confidence, but not see their pipelines grow. Mm -hmm. And so the best performing sales and marketing organizations, there's natural tension, but that natural tension is, is they're both trying to get to the same revenue outcome with, with a bit different tactics and a bit different ploys of what makes the most sense for getting there. I think the right amount of friction is the key, as you just said, right? Because a little bit of friction is actually powerful for this team, right? If it gets a little uncomfortable, you get so many leads, it gets a little uncomfortable for the sales team to actually manage them. That's not a terrible thing. And then if we're a little slow and we're pushing that marketing partner to make sure we're getting pipeline, I mean, that's actually a productive friction there, isn't it? It is a productive friction, but I think it, one of the things that's really critical in getting your teams aligned is low ego and high EQ at your at your senior leadership. So as a, as a chief revenue officer, chief executive officer, COO, or even the CMO, those people in the C-suite or VP, depending on how your organization is structured, you need to walk into um, situations knowing that there are going to be differences in opinions but an openness to understand how those opinions may take you different directions. One of the most natural tensions between like a chief revenue officer and a chief marketing officer is the CMO will come in and see, oh, well, let's see, we have brand that we need to serve to, we have customer marketing we need to take care of, we have a share of voice that we want to expand in, into the market with our brand. Looks like our content or our demand isn't really there for positioning correctly inside of the market. You know what sales said? Blah, 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 blah. I heard none of that. What is it going to do for me for revenue? Yeah. And the CMO comes back and says, well, you know, in about nine to 12 months, we should start to see these things change. And the CRO goes, I'm not going to be here in nine to 12 months. I need leads that are converting into pipeline right now. And that, that the, the paradigm there, and what I think is, is probably one of the most complex parts of the CMO role is balancing what sort of tactical things can we do to drive short-term impact into our pipeline growth, our revenue growth, and ultimately into the, uh, into the commissions and pocketbook of our sales counterparts, while also managing the long-term building out of the infrastructure and things we need to create an engine that will become evergreen and will live into perpetuity. So there's, there's a really challenging balance point but if you, if you look at it in reverse, right, the organization won't exist nine months from now if we can't hit our quota or we can't hit our revenue yeah. or our EBITDA goals. If you focus on what's short term in that decision and late consideration phase in your, in your funnel, making sure you really shore that up and then work upstream, you'll find that there's a much tighter alignment with sales in how they look at the world because they're like, oh, you you thought of me and what I needed to do for the organization first before you went out and said, oh, well, marketing, we've just got this great brand and we're doing all these things. But to me, it just looks like art and crafts, arts and crafts that didn't end up in my pipeline, didn't end up in, in my pocketbook and, you know, creates that additional kind of um, ego moment, if you will, right? If I'm serving you and what you ultimately need to serve for the business short term, we can be much tighter aligned long term. Yeah. Okay. So like if you're a if you're new to marketing, leading the marketing team, right? Is it pretty much a given that one of your top metrics or maybe the most important metric for you has to be revenue? Right? What about everything else? Well, I think I think one hundred so a couple of things, right? If you're the first if it's your first time in a role as a VP of marketing or CMO, yeah. odds are you're gonna you're gonna face a tremendous amount of judgment and criticism from your counterparts across the C-suite. Why? Because most of them have had to carry a bag, carry a quota. They've had to deliver on some level of profitability or revenue number. Mm -hmm. and, and marketers, when they come to the table, are oftentimes thought, as, thought of as the arts and crafts division, right? So you're the, hey, you're the artsy fartsy guys you think out there, but you're not really business people. As a, as a first-time marketer, come in with your business chops. If that means you need to strengthen up understanding financials, reading a P&L statement, understanding the process of what's going on, do the work. Because when you sit at that table, you need to be an equal when it comes to making good, solid, sound business decisions. Now, that being said, for aligning yourself, I'll give you a couple of shortcuts. The first place you want to align on is revenue. Now, revenue is 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 twofold revenue retention what am i getting that's reoccurring that i'm retaining as well as revenue that we are growing 
nine times out of 10, you as a marketer will get instrumented on revenue growth. They want to see what part of the market are we actually capturing. Yeah. But don't forget about the existing customers because there's a lot of work marketing needs to do around retention, engagement. Those people, if you're if you're tight to them while they're being retained and being engaged, you can turn them into evangelists that become marketing material to help you with your referrals. Like there's a there's an ecosystem that you want to feed. So you can't ignore your customers. But given that 70 to 80 percent of your focus is going to be on net new, then what you the first place the way you need to think about it is systems, well, process, systems, people. And, and do it in that order or any order that you, you think. But for me, it's systems, people, process. I always start with process. When the in back in the day, there was Schoolhouse Rock. Schoolhouse Rock had a had a little um, skit or sketch or what whatever two minute vignette that was. I'm a bill. I'm a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill, and it talks about how it goes from just being a committee set of notes and turns itself into legislation. What you need to do as your first time in the marketer in this position, you need to understand what is my sales process. How does something go from a lead all the way through to close? What are the questions that are asked? What are the typical engagements? You really need to attach yourself to that customer journey. Once you understand the process, then you can begin instrumenting where does marketing align and where can marketing actually have impact at the bottom of the funnel? In a late in a late stage consideration, moving into SAL, sales accepted, or even a sales qualified lead, that early stage before opportunity, there's work that marketing can do there. But at the end of the day, what's really going to drive revenue is the pipeline. What's the number of new opportunities that I need? And, and what are we determining? Is that pre-demo, post-demo? You as a marketer need to understand intimately what are we trying to drive towards and what is the outcome that's predictable revenue for sales. So if it's a number of demos, hey, we need to do 200 demos this month, then you need to figure out how to tune your engine to drive as many demos as particularly possible as you can. If it's about driving opportunities, then start there. But understand the, the waypoints and the spots where you, their handoff is, and that's what you need to tune for first. Because once you get to where you're actually moving pipeline, then your world opens up for how you can expand out and beyond into email opens and website visits and conversion rate. But until you really identify, are we moving the number of demos? Are we moving the number of opportunities? Are we moving that metric tied to the pipeline for sales? If you've not done that, you've not done baseline of setting a level expectation with your sales counterpart. Yeah, I like that. I love that analogy. The 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 schoolhouse rock thing. That's <laughs> fortunately we're old enough to understand that one, but <laughs> to remember that one. But it's a great analogy because I think what you're saying, what I'm hearing you saying is like, you, it's so important to understand that process first, because if you don't have a really good understanding of the whole process of the sales, you know, start to close, then you it's like you're going in and trying to um, fix something before you actually know how the whole thing is supposed to work. So it forces, I think, and I think it does two things, right? As I'm hearing you describe it, and I think back to my experiences, it, not only does it teach you, that, not only do you get an understanding of it, but it also then builds your credibility because now you're engaging in conversations at that strategic level. Um, and, and I think it puts you a little bit more on par. So I, I, I definitely, I, I like that one. I love that one a lot. And I, I think it's a great place to start um, with the with, with process. I also like the process tech, tech and the talent thing too. Uh, just, just a good way to uh, try and to look at that. You know, um, I was thinking about your comment. At first of all, I carried a bag, so I feel pretty good about that, which I think is really important for marketers, right? If you didn't carry a bag, um, I think a great first idea for them is to get out in the truck or get out on the demo. Make sure you get intimate with them and sit in on a couple calls, right? Learn about what that process looks like. Learn about when they get stumped, right? I think a lot of marketers kind of, you know, separate themselves, unfortunately, from that process, and they have to be intimate with it, to your point. I, I Listen, I, I agree. I think there are a lot of marketers, uh, in, in, and specifically, you know, I think we've seen it change and evolve a lot, but there's still a lot of the old, the old guard in the thinking of, well, marketing is job is just to get you in front of people, and then it's your job to figure out how to gauge their interest and move them towards close. With the with the evolution of websites, the advent, you know, the, the accessibility of information, my ability to do reviews, watch YouTube, I mean, just the the infantile nature of information that's out there, 
think that the the shift in the balance of responsibility for closing a sale is shifting more and more to the marketing team. Can I overcome the objections? Can I show them and help them visualize themselves in this particular product or lifestyle or thing prior to them ever connecting with a salesperson? Right. That yeah. it used and there's a there's a there's a funnel that used to be. 30% marketing, 70% sales, and now it's probably 80% marketing, 20% sales. Yeah. And so in understanding and being cognizant of that, you're absolutely right. You don't know what a salesperson goes through to overcome objections, hear what the customer's thinking, looking at their environment, right? If you're sending, um, let's say you're, you're a software vendor for a construction industry and you're sending something out that's, I don't know, flowers that are pink to a very masculine work site, like that doesn't work. Like you need to be sensitive to what's going on with your customers, their surroundings, the sales team, uh, because that becomes an extension of your brand. The more authentic you can be and the more uh, unassuming you can be as you walk into an organization or as an organization starts to do business with you, even in small non-revenue type ways, picking up phone calls, answering emails, taking packages, whatever it may be, those, those brand moments go back to your authenticity. If you've not sat next to a sales rep, if you've not gone out and talked to customers, how will you ever come across as, across as authentic? And I think that's one of the things that a lot of marketers in, in their early stages, right? They, the first mistake that I see a lot of marketers make when they, when they come in is, is they want to go in and they want to change everything and they want to start at the top. Can't start at the top. You got to start at the bottom and you got to work back slowly, but you got to work back based on understanding what's actually happening with the process, what's actually happening with the customer before you can then go assess, well, do I have the right systems? Do I have the right people? You can't understand that until you understand the process and your prospect. Sitting with salespeople and going out, that's a great, I've done that a lot. <clears throat> what are some other ways that uh, you would recommend to, to, to learn that process, right? Especially like, let's say, uh, let's say you're not only, not only new to the marketing role, but maybe you're new to the company too, right? So you're, you're taking it all in. What would you say there? Well, I think what I what I have found is the some of the biggest advocates for marketing and helping marketing be success successful actually sit inside the finance department. The finance team has a great understanding of how information flows through the organization. They have a great understanding of how revenue flows through the organization, and typically inside of your ops team. Um, if you, if you're not going into a group that has a marketing operations person or a sales operations person or rev ops team, your finance team typically has some level of, of insight or, um, at least directional understanding of where advertising and, and marketing dollars have been spent previously mm -hmm. and some of the outcomes that they've seen. Now they may not be as great attribution as you want, but that finance team having them be an ally, that finance team is just as important as the sales team. Because as you get sales saying, yes, we need more marketing dollars, you also need the confidence of finance that, hey, we're spending it in places where I feel like my voice has been heard and we can now make confident investments in, in our growth. I, I think that marketing people need to be, I would say they need to up their game in the ROI speak right? I mean, to your point, and the finance person will give it back to you, right? They'll give you the real talk track on, is your stuff really ROIing? And they'll let you know it probably before as you walk into that door. But just upping your game on understanding what your ROI is on these programs seems to be um, a place that I've heard that marketing should actually dial up. Well, I, and, I, and I think it's one of the areas that's the most complicated to try and master. But what you need to do in coming in is, is when I say it's complicated to master, it's, well, are we doing on return on marketing spend? Are we doing only return on ad spend? Are we actually doing cost of goods sold? Are we rolling up sales and marketing? What do we do with part? I mean, it just, there's, there's a lot of different ways that sausage is made. But here's the thing you can't be as, as a marketer coming in wanting the confidence of your, your sales partner or the rest of the business. You can't come in afraid to go in and ask dumb questions, get yourself dirtied up to really understand how the sausage is made. Mm -hmm. How are we building our, um, our financial intellectual property? What we're selling to the board or we're selling back to the shareholders. That information as a marketer, the business decisions, because that's what they look at. That's, that's oftentimes hard because we're used to words and we're used to pictures and we're used to thinking of things, but but really the math behind it and understanding that speaking to and say, well, 
you know, uh, for example, return on ad spend versus marketing spend. Well, what's the variance? One is segregated just to specific ads. So if I'm spending money on Google or LinkedIn or third party placement, that's my advertising spend. But then when I go to marketing spend, I have my tech cost, I have my over operational overhead, I have my salaries. It's a different variant of the ROI. What are we calculating against and what are we trying to achieve? Once you understand your inputs, you can have much better articulated answers to, to, to talk to what's happening with our sales funnel, what's happening with our marketing funnel, what's happening with, you know, what's happening with our investments that we're making and, and being able to see it come back around. And, and again, I can't stress enough that from a credibility standpoint, that first 90 days, that first 90 days sales needs to understand you are here not to make their life harder to help actually make their life easier, that you want to drive sales for them. Conversely, finance wants to know that you're not just over here to go spend willy nilly and blow a bunch of money. So you have this, you have this really hard internal branding thing where you come in with, Hey, I've got everything. I've got it. I'm an an almost an overconfidence. You want to be confident, but you also want to have a level of openness, humility, and the ability to learn because you're, you're really winning friends and influence through how you start that first 90 days. Yeah, so true. The other thing I would mention about finance, I think, because I agree on all the points, uh, finance is also a great place to truly understand um, uh, how, where the business makes its money, right? How, like what's the engine of the business? And I think knowing that is critical too, because if you're if your marketing support is for the for the main engine, you know, that's different than if you're uh, if, if some of your marketing activity is supporting a new line or a new uh, venture, right? You just have to know those things. That having an awareness of that is, is really critical to know, to, to make to be able to make some of the strategic decisions that you're going to have to make. It, it, it very much is. And I think one of the things, you know, we've, we've gone over a lot of things is like, oh, wow, we could tie ourselves to revenue and got to understand the process yeah. and I got to understand the customer and all these different things. Well, actually, I think that sometimes with, with marketing, we try and make it too complicated. And when it, when it boils right down to it, your KPIs, discuss those with finance, discuss those with, with the sales team and understand what are we, what are we moving towards and tie yourself to that, that opportunity and revenue number. Get yourself tied to a KPI that is going to move the business forward mm-hmm. and then work with your team and finding the, you know, the early indicators or the things that we think will move those and building your experiments against yeah. it. But one of the big things that typically happens is, is that during this learning curve, a lot of new leaders or a lot of new marketing people just kind of be like just riding along, catching up and not, um, not really being in a driver's seat of, of helping control their own destiny. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that I think is really, really important is getting on a regular cadence, not with um, just meeting as sales leaders or as management, but actually getting to where your entire marketing team on a weekly basis is presenting to sales a, here's what marketing did last week. Here's what's planned for this week. And then taking a step to sit back, shut up and listen. You've been doing the hard work as the leader, but you also want the people on your team talking to the sales team and closing that feedback loop and creating an opportunity each week to get feedback on uh, what am I, what are my leads like? What are we hearing in the market? Is there a giant shift? You know, are we, are we getting sensitive to price? Do we need to like the, the, because sales team is talking to the leads that you're turning over to them, giving them a, an open forum to provide feedback on the campaigns, programs, and things that we're doing is, is mission critical to really setting up your team and your tenure as a, a leader of marketing for success because sales needs to understand what marketing is doing. Historically, most companies are horrible. And you could say, oh, no, our company is great. Fantastic. If I go ask 80% of your sales team, will they be able to tell me with 100% confidence what you did last week or this week? If the answer is no, then you're not doing a good job taking your message and getting out to the team what you and your team inside of marketing are working on. So a weekly a weekly meeting, probably by your third or fourth week in that position with sales, here's what we did, just going through. And, and don't, don't take anything of it personal. If sales hates it, if they, if they, if they whine and complain about what you thought was your best program or somebody on the team thought was best program, that's okay. The opportunity here is not to worry about being right or being perfect. What you're striving for here is success and success is a continuous, honest feedback loop with your sales counterparts. So you don't have poor lead quality or poor program quality, wasting effort in your, in your, 
the stuff you're working. Yeah. It goes back to the high EQ again, right? You got to have high EQ to be able to have those conversations. So, okay. But let's play the flip side of that though, right? So what if, because sales is also infamous for like, hey, it's it's always, it's not, it's never their problem. It's always somebody else's, right? So it's the, the reason we're not, we're not bringing in revenue is always somewhere else. How do you counter for that? Where does, you know, talk to me a little bit about that. See this, and this is the one where I think it's, this is challenging and here's why. In your first 90 days, it's going to be your fault. Like, I, you're, you're new in your role. It's marketing's fault that you're not growing fast enough. It's marketing's fault that sales isn't doing enough. And it's your job to shut up and listen, take some structure, share some things about what the team is working on, but it's your opportunity to gather data points, both structured data that you can collect out of systems and unstructured data, which would be anecdotal information coming in for the conversations you're having in the sales team. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to the end of 60 days, you should be able to look through your sources, your lead types, your channels, and you should be able to assess with a degree of confidence based on what sales is telling me, what I've seen on the floor. Are we getting the right types of leads as early indicators? Or are we getting the wrong types of leads? Mm -hmm. So are we directionally correct or directionally incorrect? As you start to understand where you're directionally correct in that last 30 days, as you're coming out of 60 into 90, I, I encourage anybody that's listening to roll up your sleeves. If you're not good at spreadsheets, if you're not good at data, find a buddy inside of the company or outside of the company that is and ask all of the questions you can. How many days did it take for us to call them the first time? How many days after we called them the first time did it take for it to open up an opportunity? How many emails did we send? How many of those came from the sales team? How many of those came from marketing? What does our cadence and our sequence look like? Was this a lead that came from paid media? Was it unpaid media? Was it a referral? Ask as many questions as you can because you don't know. And, and coming in and assuming anything of the data or the information is a bit of a fool's errand. It's a little bit like trying to do attribution before you really understand the life cycle of your customer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need to understand as much as you possibly can about the journey and what's happening and ask a bunch of questions. Sometimes you're like, there's aren't going to relate. But I think what you'll find is the harder you look at the data, the clearer it becomes and you'll find that story to articulate, not necessarily a counterpoint, but maybe a series of um, growth initiatives, growth hacks, mm -hmm. or um, special plays that you can run alongside with sales to try and help combat some of those strong opinions and, uh, you know, the blame game, if you will. But, right. but you can't come from a defensive position. You have to come from a position of you're really seeking to understand and you have to do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I would say is that most organization leaders that I've been around, they get to a certain point and they're like, I'm done. The ones that I've seen that are exceptional are the ones that push through and ask another 30, 40, 50 questions. And they come back and they go, you know what it looks like? It looks like our territories are out of alignment because we're actually taking 30% of our leads. They're going over here, which is where our sales are higher. And if we realign the territories, this might make, this might actually make uh, an improvement in how we're working our leads through. So, there, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things you can look at. Not that that's marketing's job to make recommendations on territories, but you got to ask a lot of questions and you got to ask a lot of questions all the way through the revenue cycle. I like the way you articulated about doing the heavy work and bringing in the data because, you know, some people find themselves and this is, you know, your inexperienced leaders sometimes find themselves trying to make friends with their salesperson and the sales team is giving them things to do. Here's your to-do list marketer. I want you to do this. And, and, you know, the, the, the thing is they're wanting to help their salesperson. They're wanting to build that relationship, but they find themselves in this trap of just ticking off all the stuff that they've been asked to do without really following the data, which puts them in a different conversation. It, it really does. And just, I mean, a, a real world example, I've been working with, uh, worked with an organization in the past who um, they were in the process of centralizing their marketing team across multiple multiple different companies in a private equity type play. And as they were centralizing, they, they implemented a project management system, got really good at ticking off the tasks on the project management piece. But when you came in, sat down and analyzed what was going with the organization, my first question was, is, okay, I see MQLs are moving up, but I'm not seeing revenue or ARR moving at the same pace. Are we getting the right quality of lead? 
And the the people I spoke with, the leaders were like, doesn't matter, the leads are going up. Yeah, but if if it's not transferring down through, where are we broken? Because more at the top, in theory, right, needs more at the bottom. And if marketing is has been focused on delivering things, but it's not changing the revenue profile, what are we doing? And, you know, there's kind of these this deer and headlights look. And it's like, listen, this is not a this is not an indictment on anybody. But if you don't understand what happens after an MQL moves, what happens next? How is it getting contacted? All of those questions, when, where, why, what, how, how can you analyze if it's the right kind of lead? How can you analyze if you're equally paired with your, your sales team? How can you manage resourcing? You, you can't answer any of those questions until you really understand. And many, many, many organizations are busy doing, tactically executing, and not taking a step back and saying, but is it having a meaningful impact? And that's probably the single most important question you'll have to answer over and over and over and over as you, as a, as a leader in marketing, did what I did, did what my team did, are the things that we executed, did it have an impact and did it move the revenue needle? So revenue obviously is one way to show impact. What's in, what are other metrics that beside beyond revenue that, that you'd look at? Oh, well, for me, again, I kind of go back to the, the beginning. I look at I look at percentage of revenue contributed via marketing, and typically that's just a byproduct of the, the makeup into the pipeline. Mm-hmm. With most organizations are probably not really good at giving credit to marketing early on, and so you're probably looking at 20, 30 percent of the of the pipeline is attributed to marketing. Mm-hmm. But in most organizations today, that if they really ask themselves, how did somebody hear about us, whether it was, you know, in-app advertising or something triggered off or a referral, like there's some level of marketing's influence to participate with that. But through that, uh, I think one of the things or sales and marketing leaders need to do is sit down and, and outline what do we want our sources and, and what are our rules of engagement if it comes from a paid, came from Google, but they call themselves a referral. Does that go to Google? Does it go to does it go to referral? Sit down and actually define the lead types and where they're coming from. And once you've done that, then what I would expect is, is that you would see over the course of two to three quarters, marketing going from that 20 to 30% of contributed pipeline to north of 70%. Like, and, and it would happen naturally and evolve. But in, in, the, in the highest growth organizations where sales is just executing, they're just selling over and over and over, you'll typically see that 80, 85% plus of that pipeline came directly from marketing and they've worked hyper and been hyper vigilant on the, the, the baton handoff, the exchange between sales and marketing to know this type of lead closes at this rate. We've got a one in three chance of closing it. Here's how we're going to, here's how we're going to handle it. That, that model has become predictable. Yeah. That's where you, that, so you got revenue, but then it's pipeline contributed to revenue. And then the indicator before that, to me, that's your 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 number of pages per visit, your cost per page per visit, yeah. um, you know the traffic that you're actually getting to the site. Can I scale it? Do I need to scale it organically? Can I scale it in, inorganically? That's but but really, you're looking at that pipeline mix first. Yeah. Get it figured out how where the pipeline's coming from marketing, how you're tightly aligned with sales, so that profile changes. And then you're you've got the confidence of finance, you've got the confidence of sales, and you're 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 functioning at a high, functioning at a high rate. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Now all these numbers and metrics and things, stuff like that, it's got to come from systems. You, there's got to be some sort of systems in play, right? And then that's the third part that you talked about, right? The tech. So let's talk a little bit about that, because you know whether there's a system in place or not. I mean, part of marketing's leader's job is to is to make sure you you you're able to track what you need to track, right? So, um, you know, the, and there's there's the kind of some of the tried and true systems out there. Uh, you know, I'm curious, what's your take on some of these? You know, like, what would you recommend in terms of uh, maybe just a quick lightning round? Some of the, the, the most common base platforms, you know, are they reliable? What would you say about those? All right, well, before we go through that, I have to tell you this right now. If you do not have a process, do not go pick a system, <laughs> All right? So I just, it's like... 101 here, you would think that this yeah. is software makes a terrible master. Yeah. Going in and trying to use a, a software to, to do your operation, the way the software thinks, functions and operates without your own bias, 
is a bit of a fool's errand. Yeah. Come in with your own process so that the software you can ask questions of, can it serve you effectively? Now, you might need to change a few things, but at the end of the day, as a marketing leader, as a marketing organization, you need to understand your baseline process, ultimately what you're tracking before you even go out to, to bid or look at technology. Mm -hmm. I say this because 20 years ago, when I started my first agency, right, I leaned heavily into, you had two choices. You had uh, web stats, which came on your server, or you could use Google Analytics. So we were all flocking towards Google Analytics and then trying like hell to figure out how to do goals and conversion things. And what if I need more than 20 goals? Stop. Document your process, document what you want to track, and then start to meet with the vendors. The vendors who talk to you as an equal the vendors who understand your process and the vendors who can best articulate how their software will configure and or support your process is where you need to focus. Now, there are some big players. And here's what I will say when, when paraphrasing the big players. There's email marketing engines. Now, there are a lot of companies out there that want to go be something different. SharpSpring, NetResults, MailChimp, um, Constant Contact, Aweber. I mean, I could go on and on. There's a bunch of just email marketing platforms. Now, I know the guys from Net Results are like, hey, but we're marketing automation. You are. However, you just don't have the same level of marketing automation sophistication as like a HubSpot or like a, uh, a Pardot. But the thing you got to be careful of is there's a difference between a marketing automation platform and a lead management platform. If you need sophistication of I've got in-app product marketing, things that I need. I need to be able to tag this person, both transactionally, marketing, and sales. What you need is you need a lead management system. If you have a level of sophistication where it's not like, hey, I'm just getting something in and I'm working a list for marketing and and, and helping convert things on landing pages, I really want to tie it closely to a, an application, I need a lead management system. So you need something like Aloqua, Pardot, uh, Marketo, Net results fits in there in, in, in some of that space. Mm -hmm. Or you can use SendGrid, um, Mixpanel, some of these others where they have the, the lead management tied to a, a SMTP service. When it comes to true marketing automation, you have, um, you have Salesforce who says, oh, our marketing cloud does some. It does. I mean, it has, has some very strong capabilities and power. Most small leaders, most small businesses aren't going to have the sophistication to be able to get the most out of marketing cloud. Mm -hmm. Just not going to, just don't waste your time. Uh, when it comes to HubSpot, HubSpot's doing a really great job serving the broader marketer. However, it's much better served for transactional high velocity, um, managing kind of a one-to-one, -one, the contact can come back and buy on, on regular mm -hmm. versus more of an account-based marketing tool. So you have to be really careful with the tools you select and what you're trying to do with it, which is why I go back to process. What are we trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. Who's our customer before you pick your tool? Mm -hmm. um, but, but for me, if I were to pick and I had to start off with just, I need a tool for marketing automation, I'm going out and I'm going to buy Keep. If, I'm, if I can't afford the $3,600 for the enterprise level of, of HubSpot, or I'm going to go buy HubSpot and get probably their, uh, their professional professional level, which I think is around 800 bucks a month. The, the variance between those two, you get very similar capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, but with, with HubSpot, you have much higher upside with keep about the time you needed to have been on HubSpot and, and paying for the 800 to a thousand dollar a month subscription, you've outgrown keep anyways. So um, those are typically the two tools that most small businesses I work with will, will be using. Yeah. Kyle, I heard you say the other day, you know, a good kind of range because I work with a lot of startups and scale ups and that kind of thing. What was the range that, you know, HubSpot's got to love to love around the lower ranges? You said something. Yep. So for me, um, zero to about two and a half, potentially grow into five is really where keep is 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 fantastic. I think HubSpot somewhere between that two and a half to 10 million is really, really, really where you start to see the revenue return and for the investment because you can start to, to get some magnitude or quantity of scale. Once you get above 30 million, most marketing automation platforms as they are now need to be split into two or three technologies. You need to be really good at your process and segmentation. And what you need is a lead management system 
not just a marketing automation tool. I know HubSpot is working hard on, on fixing some of these things, but based on my experience, having been in a local part of and, and Marketo above, above 30 million, you really need the power of scaling to the next level that you would get from a Marketo, a part or a, uh, a loqua. Good. So Kyle, I think this has been a great conversation. Uh, we covered a lot of really good stuff, I think, and it's helpful because I think looking back at some of the experiences I've had, right. You know, I, I would think, gosh, man, I wish I would have thought of some of these things or had these experience. So in kind of a closing way to, to wrap all this up, if you were to, if you could go back in time to the first time that you were leading marketing, right what, now, knowing what you know now, what would you tell your old self? Oh, what advice? Would you um, apply, apply a lot of grace to yourself and apply even more grace to your team. Uh, one of the things that we didn't really get to today, but I'll just leave it here as kind of a finishing thought is, is it's really easy to come in and think, oh, we need to make change to staff because we have a talent issue. Until you understand what your measurements are, until you understand how you're aligning with the sales team, until you understand what's going on with your customer and the actual process of everything coming through, and then the systems that your team is operating out of, it's really hard to assess them on their their aptitude or even the skills they bring to the table. So for me, going back to that original, that original time in, in marketing leadership, I'd say apply a lot more grace to yourself. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. It's okay. Um, but that grace you apply to yourself, apply even more to your team until you have enough context to start really measuring them. And, um, you know, I think that would have, that would probably transformed my first six months, six months in a, in a, in a leadership role. Had I just been more patient with the team and more patient with myself. That's good advice. Very good advice. Uh, the things I think that I was taking down that I kind of in terms of wrapping or key takeaways. One is just like, uh, having good, uh, uh, understanding yourself and, and emotional, your EQ, right? Your, your emotional intelligence, you got, you got to have to have a strong base of that. Cause you're going to, you're going to go through a lot. Um, and there's going to be a lot of that collaboration, but also conflict. So hold steady to that. Um, obviously revenue key metric, but I like your one also percentage of pipeline contributed directly to our marketing. You, if that's a great one. And if you, if you don't feel like you have a good handle on that, figuring out how to measure that, um, challenging, but start with something because that's a that's a that's a fundamental one. Um, the structure, right? Developing that structure that that I have the recommendation you made in terms of how to set up these meetings with you know have these sales regular meetings with all of the sales teams so that they know what marketing is doing. Um, love that recommendation. And then lastly, like you have to know the process. You've got to start uh, like start with the process. That's where it all begins because the tech will support that. Your team, once you understand the process and what your goals are, then you can also assess where your what, what your team is at and where you need to fill gaps. Um, so I think putting p approaching it that way, to me, feels like you have the best chance of creating and fostering a, a, a strong relationship with the sales team. Yeah, it, it, th those are those are those are some of the basics. And I don't think there's a single. There's a single marketing leader, actually any leader that takes a position their first time, their second time, third time, first time with a new company where it wouldn't benefit from having a, having a colleague or a, uh, you know, a, a safety valve. So find somebody who's a, a marketing leader or somebody who you trust their, their insight in business and, and lean into that relationship during that first six, nine months, use them as a sounding board and, um, you know, make sure that you're, you're thinking about the problem in 360 degrees, not just the, you know, the, the laser focus right in front of you. Yeah, yeah. I think we can, we can tend to be like rhinos. The thing about rhinos that's unique is, is that they will run 30 miles an hour. That's where they max out at, but they can only see 30 feet in front of them. <laughs> and so I think having that mentor and having somebody else around you will keep you from being a rhino yeah. and going in and potentially doing mass destruction as you're trying to set up your company for success. <laughs> That's a good one. I didn't Boy, know that about rhinos. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, if people wanted to find out or get in touch with you, how can they reach out to you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think it's forward slash I N Kyle Hamer all, all together, or you can go out to Hamer marketing group.com. Uh, I've got some blog articles. You can get in touch with me. Uh, if you have questions, drop me a line on LinkedIn, send me something through the contact form. I'm an open book, happy to help and support. 
our industry revenue and, you know, kind of the next generation of marketers in any way possible. Well, thanks very much, Kyle. Thanks. Great having you on. I appreciate the, uh, the insight and advice. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me.